Welcome, everyone, to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. On today's episode, another Salem podcaster, broadcaster, radiocaster, you name it, he's all over the place. He's a wonderful thinker, a great mind. Hugh Hewitt joins us next. Now, it's time for some sanity. It's the Michelle Tafoya podcast. I'm really excited today to welcome Hugh Hewitt because he is a wonderful thinker. He's so well connected. You've probably heard him on the radio at some point. He wakes up the morning uh, for America every day. And by wakes up the morning, I mean, he starts your day for you with all kinds of news and opinion. Hugh Hewitt is just one of the most wonderful broadcasters we have in America. He's just interesting. Uh, he's got a law degree from Michigan. He went to Harvard, graduated with honors, and you will hear all of that on display when we talk to him in one moment. But first, I got to remind you about Mother's Day. It's coming up. And a great way to celebrate your mom is by giving her a gift from Genucel. This is a wonderful skincare product line that I use, formulated with skin nourishing antioxidants, powerful peptides in a proprietary base that is made right here in the USA. And every mom loves time to take care of her skin so now she can look good and feel good. This stuff is formulated by a pharmacist with high quality ingredients. Products will noticeably smooth out fine lines and wrinkles, so you'll see them right away, and then it'll prevent others from starting. And my favorite is the Deep Firming Serum. I use this stuff every day right after I, I cleanse my skin. It's got stem cell technology, and I swear I see an instant change in my skin. Right now, you can save over 70% off, 70% off Genucel's most popular package. It features Genucel's Ultra Retinol that contains a powerful retinol alternative. It's safe on pregnancies, safe for breastfeeding, so moms can use this. You'll also receive Genucel's Dark Spot Corrector to reduce the appearance of dark marks and sunspots from those long summer days outside. Plus, you'll still get Genucel's classic under eye bags therapy for those annoying eye bags and puffiness. And with its immediate effects, see results in as little as 12 hours guaranteed or your money back. What do you have to lose? Take care of your mom. Celebrate her by going to genucel.com slash Michelle. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Michelle with one L, M-I-C-H-E-L-E. -E. Save over 70% off their most popular package. Plus, every package includes a luxury gift box with three free springtime essentials. That's three Free gifts plus concierge shipping, which is free as well for a limited time. Go to genucel.com slash Michelle, G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash Michelle. Happy Mother's Day. Well, what a pleasure and an honor to have Hugh Hewitt with us today. Thank you for being here. There is so much I could talk to you about. And I, so I'm going to start with this overarching question, if it's okay with you. You betcha. What is... What is your single biggest concern about our country right now, Hugh? Uh, the infirmity of the president. And I don't wish that on anyone, but I watched the MSNBC interview with Stephanie Rule, and I, and I know Stephanie from my time at NBC, and I said to myself, she's throwing underhand softballs and he can't hit them. And so it's like, you can't send him back to the minors, right? He's just too old to be president. And that worries me every day. And that worries you more than it, because that's the root of all the other things that we're experiencing, like this crisis at the border. Yeah, I'm going to be on special report tonight and we're going to talk about the border. I got the rundown on and there's not much to be said other than no one's driving the plane. It's sort of like the uh, airplane movie from the 80s when Bob sits down and takes over the controls. That no one's driving the airplane at the White House. And I just do not think people quite understand how many decisions the president of the United States has to make every day that requires competency. Maybe I don't and agree with the decisions, but just competency. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you're correct. I think we're all seeing it and anyone who denies it is fooling themselves, but you don't think there's any, let me, let me focus in on Susan Rice and her departure from the white house. My belief was that she was the one driving the plane and that the president was just sort of the mouthpiece. She's gone. Why do you think she left? Well, I think Ron Klain actually was the driver for the first two years. And then when Ron Klain left, there's no, then it was Susan Rice. And Susan Rice didn't want that because what Susan Rice is famous for is telling presidents what not to do. She told President Obama not to bomb Syria after they used chemical weapons. She's very good at politics, and she's very bad at policy. So she's not the chief of staff. It's now Jeff Zients, who I 
I don't know from Adam. I've never sat down with Jeff like I knew Ron Klain, like you and I've had a couple of uh, conversations before. I have never, ever talked to Jeff Zeit, so I don't know what his capacity is. But being the chief of staff in the White House is a very hard job. And and the additional trouble of having an incapacitated, I don't want to say incapacitated, I mean infirm. And by that I mean, in our business, you simply go away at 75. That's what happens at 75. You just kind of go away unless you're Dennis Prager and you're built out of whatever they make in Wakanda. You're <laughs> off the air. And so I got eight years left, maybe nine if I if I stretch it. But the voice gives in. You stop doing it. You're not on the air at 80. There is no 80 year old broadcaster out there other than I think Vin Scully maybe did it. But he was the greatest and best ever. Right. Do you know any other 80 year old broadcaster? I don't. I do not. I don't know. I know that, you know, I remember when John Madden stepped aside, he stepped aside because he said, it's time. It's it's time. And, you know, hopefully you have people around you in this business or any other who will tell you it's time. They're not telling Biden this, I think, because some people feel that they can control him. But I'm not sure who is controlling him. And and as you said, there's no one steering the plane. It does feel like we're in for a crash landing here. So he is going to run. And some devastating poll numbers have come out this week showing his, his approval rating is at an all-time time low of 36, I believe. And Kamala Harris's approval rating ain't much better. So I, I don't know how this president thinks he can win again unless he's counting on He's the guy that can beat Trump. What do you think? I think you are right. I think Dr. Joe Biden has something to do with this. Uh, Edith Wilson kept Woodrow Wilson going in the last year of his presidency after a stroke. And maybe Dr. Biden just likes being first lady. And, and maybe there is a different Joe Biden that we don't see when he just wakes up and when he's ready to go. But I, I tell you, Michelle, my dad was 80 when he died. And so I saw him from 75 to 80 begin to decline. And I've worked with enough people in broadcast that back when I got started in nineteen in 2000 on, on Salem, we had a guy on in L.A., I'm not going to name his name, and he had, he had stayed past the sell-by date. And you know what made them take him off was 9-11. Uh, they just said, we can't do it anymore. We can't have someone on the air who cannot handle an information flow at this speed. And, you know, our business is very different now. And in your world of both sports and politics, it's very different. The incoming is so much faster that if you're not processing, it's just very hard to be president. It's the hardest job in the world. And, you know, Xi Jinping is watching. Putin is watching. That's what worries me the most. Now, on a domestic issue side, I probably worry more about um, uh, financial crises than I do the border. But the border is up there. Really? We're going to be talking about the border tonight. Financial crises, man, I don't know what you were doing in 2008. But in 2008, every day I'd come in and try and reassure a few million people your world isn't going to end today. And W had a bunch of us come to the White House, half dozen talk show hosts in the uh, last Wednesday of his presidency. And he said, let me tell you, I want you to go easy on the new guy, Obama. And the reason is you have no idea what it's like for Sunday after Sunday, Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke to sit on that couch. And we're in the Oval, so you shut up, you let the president talk. On that chair would be Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke telling me if I didn't do something I'd sworn my whole life not to do, bail out Big Bang that the entire economy would crash. Okay, that's a hard job. You gotta make tough yeah. choices. You gotta know when to depart from your political position. 80 year olds yes. don't do that well. They just don't do that well. Well, I, I agree with you. And, and you know, I think it was John Fetterman's wife, Giselle, who called anyone who thought that he was not fit for office, John Fetterman, an ableist. Well, yeah, I guess I'm an ableist if I want people in office who know what they're doing and where they are at all times and are competent to make decisions. It seems to me that if you're kind of a, a shell of yourself, you're not. And this is the most powerful position in the world. And I think what you said earlier about Xi Jinping and Putin watching all of this, that that is rather terrifying. And there's no way we can handle four more years of this. Who can beat Biden? Is it or is it only Trump? No, I think everyone can beat Biden. I really do. I think okay. everyone can if they insist on nominating, because if the last two years are, the, are a prediction of the next two years, it's going to get worse. And it's going yeah. to get so bad that no one can hide it. No one can deny it. So LBJ, for the benefit of your younger listeners, Lyndon Johnson was running for reelection until he wasn't in 1968. And he wasn't when Eugene McCarthy came within 
a couple of heartbeats of beating him in, in New Hampshire. And then he said, oops, I guess I got this Vietnam thing wrong. I'm out. <laughs> And then Bobby Kennedy jumped in and George McGovern jumped in and then Bobby Kennedy got shot. And it was just kind of, okay, we went with Hubert Humphrey because he's the last guy standing. They may have that scramble, but uh, the vice president is also not blowing me away with her ability, right? Now, I'm, I'm not ageist. I am, uh, I am myself 67 years old. I don't want to have ageist running around. But I watch the presidency in the way that you watch it, in the way that, that you know all of your your best stuff. I know the presidency. He's not up to it. She's not up to it. Now they got some Democrats who are up to it. Josh Shapiro, governor of Pennsylvania, superb five-star talent. It's like having, and I'm an Ohio State fan, so it's like having a five-star quarterback sign with Michigan. I hate that. You know, they got the guy on the bench. They got Josh Shapiro and he's on the bench. They got Jared Polis in Colorado. He's pretty good. I don't think Amy Klobuchar is mayor pizza disaster, but they got people that could beat former President Trump that could beat Governor DeSantis. They're, they got good candidates. I don't think, I really don't think he can hit the pitching anymore. So we're not going to have trouble beating Biden. Well, so, it, but Biden has declared he's only got two challengers right now. Uh, RFK has what, uh, I think 20% right now yeah. in the polling, um, which is kind of shocking considering, you know, he's sort of just come out of nowhere and, and he's said some controversial things, but, you he's know, Aaron Rodgers has endorsed he's, him. But he's he, a kook. What, Bobby Kennedy okay. the third is a kook. And so <laughs> why do you call him a kook, Hugh? And his book. And they sent me his book about you know, he's always been anti vaxxer and he's always been yeah. this not not anti COVID vaccine, just all vaccines. He's mm-hmm. always had sort of out there left not left wing, just kinda of off the chart weird stuff. And <laughs> he's a Kennedy, he's Bobby's son. I Bobby Kennedy's the first guy I ever had a poster of because I'm Catholic from Ohio, so Bobby Kennedy had to be who I was for in sixty eight when I was 12 and I would like him to be other than he is, but he's a crank. And um, if he's got 20%, there are 20% cranks. That's people <laughs> saying, golly, Joe Biden, they're sending a message to Joe Biden by yeah, saying I'd yeah. vote for Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Marianne Williamson, no one's really taking her very seriously. Cause if, if, if RFK is a kook, she's a little, She's a little out there. Uh, she's interesting, but she's not afraid. And I give her credit for that. She'll talk to anyone on any platform. Yes. And I admire her for that. That's good stuff. Yes. All right. So it, on the other side, then we know Trump is running. We feel DeSantis sort of, you know, heading there. Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, probably no chance. Tim Scott has an exploratory campaign out there. Uh, where do you, how do you see this shaking out? Is, is DeSantis ready to knock off Trump. And I mean that from the standpoint of, does he have the policy and the pol- the political stuff to knock off Trump? Uh, I think it's very possible. I had Governor DeSantis on my show on Friday for 28 minutes, which is a long time to talk to him, but uninterrupted yeah. and only about the Florida legislative session because they did so much in Florida this year. It's like a red state 100 days. And I went through it. He, he doesn't know the questions. He doesn't have. He, he knows I'm going to stick to the legislature because I give him sort of an idea so he can land the plane. And there are two kinds of guests, as I'm sure you found out. Those that you can ask anything to and they're ready to answer, and those you can't ask anything to without worrying are they going to drive off the road. DeSantis right. hit. You know, he hit 700. I mean, he's he just a, a Yastrzemski triple crown winner. So is Donald Trump in terms of his ability. He's the best interview in America. So we have mm-hmm. two great candidates, Ambassador Haley, Senator Scott, four great candidates. Governor Christie's going to get in. He's a wrecking ball, and he's funny, and he's quick. You're uh, sure nimble. he's going to get in? Yeah, uh, because he was on last week, and he said, i got to make up my mind within two weeks. And I, I think he really has a grudge to settle against the president, and he really does think he'd be a much better president. And he will say, I, I was up in New Hampshire when he took apart Marco Rubio with a buzzsaw. Yeah. Yeah. If he, if he gets on the debate stage, it's going to be chips are flying. Where are your safety glasses? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if that happens then, if Christie and Trump knock each other out and that leaves kind of the the more sane guy, DeSantis, standing or, you know, is Christie likable enough to win the whole thing? Michelle, I, I learned in 2016 when I was moderating these debates <laughs> that. There is no one who knows. William Goldman is a famous screenwriter who said about Hollywood, nobody knows nothing. And that's what I think about 
the debates. They are, if yep. the president, former president doesn't show up, he's going to go down the polls. If he does show up, it's going to be pyrotechnics and, boy, set the house on fire, have some sand throw to throw on some candidate that he lights on fire. I've got my own Trump tattoos from when uh, the president leveled me a couple of times. And that's okay. That's the business, right? So if you're going to get on the stage, yeah. don't complain. It will be wild. And if there are 12 of them, the polls are going to change every week, every well, single and- week. If there are 12 of them, doesn't that favor Trump? Because he'll just knock them off and where their voters go, who knows? I mean, I, I'm curious as to why the Republican Party doesn't consolidate around yeah, a couple of people. Uh, because there is a financial incentive for every, Look, I think the ambassador and the senator are both running for vice president at the time that they run for president. Are so you talking about Senator, Senator Scott? Yeah. You meant Senator, Senator Scott. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Senator Scott and Ambassador Haley, Governor Haley, I think they're both in there knowing full well that if you run for president, A, you're always better prepared the second time around, so they're always playing up. B, lightning could strike, Trump could drop out, he could be indicted, he could be jailed, he could be on trial. So hang around, you can come back in a game even if you're down by 20 points in the fourth quarter, and, and there's no downside to it. And people like Vivek are running like Pete Buttigieg for the cabinet. And it's worked for Vivek. He's a great, have you had him on yet? He's a great interview. Yeah, I, I have, I met him when I was on Outnumbered with him on, on oh. Fox News Channel. And so we had a, yeah, he, no, there's no question. He's a guy oh, that can okay. answer any question. What's that? How often are you doing Outnumbered? I don't watch daytime TV uh, or I'd tune in for that. You'd be like, fine. Yeah. I, I I was doing it a couple times a month until recently. So uh, things have, you know, um, it's a it's a blast to do. It's a lot of fun. Oh, uh, my God. So, that's the okay. one I've never done. I'm afraid of that show. That's a that oh, you know, no. God, goes on there and he hits. You know, there are skill sets. And I, I think that's a fun show. I hope you keep doing that. it's. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that endorsement. Um, OK, so we've got. <laughs> We've got banking, we've got the border, we've got a president who's infirm, we've got China. Did you hear this recent news about a Chinese company buying the Princeton Review and Tudor.com? Have you heard this? No, but it would not surprise me because they're buying farmland next to military bases. And by they, I mean the Chinese Communist Party and its front group. Well, the chi- and, and, the, and any China company, I believe, <laughs> is ultimately controlled by yes. the Chinese Communist Party, right? Well, so I'm wondering about TikTok if we're stuck with it. We had these hearings uh, with the CEO who I found very unimpressive, um, didn't seem prepared for a lot of their questions and seemed to just say, we, we play ball like all the other platforms do. I disagree. I think they're very, uh, I think it's a sinister company. They're not owned by ByteDance. They are owned by the CCP uh, indirectly. And, and so- Are we stuck with them? We seem to have momentum toward banning it, but I I feel like that momentum has come to a halt. Well, you use the right word. It's sinister. It's a sinister company. And they collect all this data for a reason. But I looked at that hearing, and like you, I was underwhelmed. That guy was not prepared to answer about the Uyghurs. Okay, he wouldn't wouldn't even say it because he knew the whole company crashes in in China. They'll pull it if you talk about the Uyghurs. And I saw the line of lobbyists behind him. It's the best the city has. Now, I live inside the Beltway, and I know who plays that game, and I know who gets paid. There are a lot of people working the, the TikTok bike dance business, and there are a lot of investment banks, and a lot of money is at stake here. And when the former president and Mike Pompeo and Robert O'Brien lined it up to go down, they got this close, and then the money came in and shut it down. And second time around, the money has come in and shut it down. And all I can tell you is, the my, my son's getting married in the fall and uh, my future daughter in law has it on her phone. I said, do not bring that phone near me because that is I want nothing to do with a phone with TikTok right. on it because right. it's simply a listening device. Yep. Yep. Well, congratulations on the upcoming nuptials. That's that's exciting. Uh, hopefully there will be no TikTok dancing at the reception, but you never know. You um, not, yeah. it, here's one thing that really bothers me, Hugh, and I'm seeing this with TikTok and with other corporations, American companies. I, I'm not stupid. I know money is important. And I know we're in the business, in business, we're in the business of making money, right? That's what capitalism is all about. But at, when does patriotism trump capitalism? In other words, so many great American companies 
do their manufacturing in China. And when you consider the Uyghur genocide and the slavery that exists in China and other places, you know, Turkey has, I think, its share of slavery. And we farm out this manufacturing or even accept an offer to buy the Princeton Review uh, by a, a Chinese wow. company. What are we saying? Like, where is our, why are we at all forward thinking about the future of the United States of America, the freest place on earth for now? Uh, I, Michelle, I wish I could answer that question. It's the question. What is wrong with Wall Street? Uh, and what is wrong with Washington, D.C.? Because you and I see this and you and I know it. And I grew up in the Cold War. You're too young. And in the Cold War, all it was in the water. People were aware of the Soviet Union. You didn't do business with the Soviet Union. You sold them wheat. Sometimes we would sell them wheat for a geopolitical purpose and we had to get an authorizing statute. We would sell them that amount of, of help because it fed people. But we did not get into bed with them for any kind of business deal. And that should be the role. The problem is that over the from 1972 to Donald Trump, everyone, including me, thought they were evolving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. with it, we thought they were going market driven and they weren't. And then people like the NBA got addicted to the point that LeBron James, who I love because I'm from Cleveland, right? LeBron James, social justice warrior, activist, won't say a bad thing about a million Uyghurs in camps. Why? Because the money's too big. And that is the problem. So the Congress has to step in. And like you said, that was the least impressive display of agility I've seen in a witness. But he didn't care because he got the money. Uh, this is so distressing to me. I, you know, and I, I, at the risk of sounding like a nerd, I am at the moment listening to an audio book, Ron Chernow uh, on, on Washington, George Washington. Great book. This is not, this is great book. And this is the second biography, if you will, on Washington that I've listened to. And I think Elon Musk said the other day on Bill Maher's show that the kids in school learn something about George Washington, that he was a slave owner. They don't listen to, I mean, when you listen to what the revolutionary soldiers went through the continental army what they experienced to fight for freedom and i here comes my patriotism but my god those circumstances were horrific and yeah. some of these soldiers got whipped tied to a tree and whipped these are white soldiers who for trying to desert or stealing food or this was an unbelievable operation People put their lives on the line. George Washington assumed he would be eventually killed. And they did it for a cause. A, not, not money, because they certainly weren't making money. They did it for a cause. And it seems that our cause is, is being overshadowed. And, or, or we keep thinking, we're taking it for granted maybe that it's always going to be there. But my gosh, we can see the train coming. Why don't we get out of the way? Well, we're not going to get any Washingtons anytime soon because the man is the most rectitudinous, except for slavery. Now, we can say that again and again. I am glad that we are teaching slavery and the original sin of the American founding. But without slavery, you wouldn't have had the union if they had not allowed for it to be, as every framer understood, it was moral, immoral. It was only after yes. John Calhoun came along, he tried to make an argument that it was moral. But Washington was immoral. Jefferson knew it was immoral. Madison knew it was immoral. George Mason knew it was immoral. But they didn't know what to do. And they'd rather have the union because they knew that they had to get away from the Great Britain. I'm reading a new book about Washington, by the way. Brett Baer has a new one coming out. So I'm reading the, um, oh, the page great. proof to give him a gal. It's, and it's the right side. You know, chair now. Be right, you know, you're going to walk a lot of miles or run a lot of miles. Listen to chair now. That's a lot. Yes, and I have. Yes, trips. it is. But Brett's trying to do in 300 pages for a general public what you and I will listen to chair now forever. And he's doing a fine job on it. And his slave, Billy, was very close to him. But you're right yes. about Washington. If they, if we had lost, he would have hung by the neck until death. He was Absolutely. the richest man in America mm -hmm. at the time of his death because Mount Vernon was that big. And and my studio is, in fact, on the old land grant of Mount Vernon. They, they put it out. When they signed on that document, the declaration, they were signing a death warrant unless they won. And so yep. what a deal. We do not find many people other than in the uniform military services or in the police and fire department who put their line on the line every single day. Those people do, yeah. uh, but that is a rare thing in public life. We don't even have people who are so disinterested. I want to go and, and stick the landing with you. 
Joe Biden as a patriot should not run again. And people who are patriots around him should say, this isn't working, Mr. President. We can get you through the next year and a half, but you, you, this is not good for the country. And FDR thought he was the only guy who could win World War II. Turned out he wasn't. Truman was able to win World War II. So no one is irreplaceable, but people can certainly put us in peril. And I think, uh, I don't think Washington, Washington walk away. He could have been president for three terms. He walked away because he said, I'm too old for this stuff. And he walked away. Good for him. He also wanted to assure everyone there weren't going to be, you know, kings in this new place, that we were going to transfer power. And, and, and so that's another reason he walked away. And he wanted to finally enjoy some of the fruits of his labor at home. It, his, it, it's so interesting, Hugh, in this book. You're right. It's a lot of car rides and a lot of walking that I've done getting through this book. But it's so well written. It's so well written that I'm hanging on every word. And yeah. his evolution on slavery, you, you you see it, you go through it with him, and it's amazing. And it, you know, I, I, look, yeah, original sin. And people who say we're not teaching it, well, you and I seem to know an awful lot about it. I, I, yeah. We all sat as a country and watched Roots together. Remember that? We, you know, yeah. we there are countless films, countless speeches, countless books have been written and distributed throughout the United States about our flaws. We, and yet we continue to self-flagellate and, and we and somewhat ignore all the great progress that has been made because people are just so angry. I, you you should be angry about what happened, but can't isn't there the flip side to that, a more productive side to looking at progress? Yeah, yeah, I, I have got a couple of uh, of great interlocutors on this. Uh, Mark Whitlock is the pastor at at the Emanuel Zion up in Maryland. He used to be out in California, the largest AME church in the United States. And Mark is, is a man of the left, and he's a black man, and, and we talk to each other very candidly about race. And I don't understand his life, and he doesn't understand my life, but, but we know the same history. And I believe we're overdoing the emphasis on flaws, as you point out, so that this is the best place. There's a reason there are 4 million people crossing the, the border not to come to a bad country. They're crossing the border because it's the only place in the world where opportunity is open to anyone, regardless of what your station in life is. Uh, you know, the Hewitts got here in 1868. We're doing pretty well after 150 years, but the first one was a coal miner. And I don't know when the Tafoyas showed up, but whenever the first generation gets here, it's rough. It's really hard. Yeah. But they yeah. all want to come. They yeah. all want to come. If we opened up the border, we would not have 4 million. We'd have 40 million because people want to come. They're now putting everything. And I'll tell you a quick story. My daughter, military wife, and uh, one of her friends on Christmas Eve said, my nephew has entered the country. My, my husband's nephew has entered the country without permission. He has an asylum hearing. In the meantime, he has, we need some clothes. And he's 19 years old. And the community rallies around. He wants to work. He's gone to work. But you know what? Every 19-year-old in the world would come here. Every yeah. hardworking 19-year-old in the world would come here. And a lot of bad apples, too. But I don't blame them for trying. It's up to the president to stop it because we can't absorb this many people this quickly. Well, I can tell you that Tafoya's got here around the turn of the century, right before the Depression. Both my parents uh -oh. are Depression-era kids. Grew up incredibly, incredibly poor and destitute. But my dad would always tell me, my dad, who was Spanish and whose family came through South America, like so many did from Spain through Peru, et cetera, told me always, this is the greatest country on earth. You won the lottery when you were born here. And I always thanked him for that because, you know, his family made it here. My mom survived. How did you get well. into Berkeley? How did you figure that out? <laughs> Getting I mean, my first generation kids don't even know that there's a Berkeley. It's the greatest public institution in the well, country. Look, my both my parents went to Berkeley. So there I, you go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. They're bears. And yeah. then you go pick up your MBA from Trojan land. I, know. I hope you don't root for the Trojans. <laughs> I don't cheer for anyone anymore. I, I cheer for my kids. That's who I cheer for. It's It's gotten, uh, education is a whole other topic, Hugh, that we'll have to tackle another time. Uh, but it's it's Looneyville out there. I am so appreciative of you being on today. And um, thank you. I, I can't thank uh -oh. you enough. My pleasure, Michelle. Anytime. Call me back. You're doing a great job. I hope people find this and, and tell their friends about it because we don't have enough center-right, sane voices of professionals, people who actually know what they're doing. 
like you. So oh, press on, press you. on. Thank you very much, people. Subscribe like you just recommended. And don't forget, always be brave and do good. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. We'll see you next time. 